Okay, so we're talking to David Hirsch. Um, he works at Goldsmith University of London, and he's a researcher of left-wing anti-Semitism. Yes, as part of the Labour Party in England, he um, is involved um, in a struggle against anti-Semitism and boycott movements um, also from uh, the left political spectrum. And he took part, for example, in a, a website called uh, Engaged. Was it like that, <laughs> David? Um, yeah, the Enga Engaged website. Yes, uh, of um, which you can explain us a little more, maybe. Sure. Um, so, also, I've just written a book, uh, which is called uh, Contemporary Left Antisemitism. And the book is really a story, the mainstreaming of anti-Semitism um, on the left. Uh, I think it's a global phenom phenomenon, but my book is mainly uh, takes its material from Britain. Um, and it's about the mainstreaming since about 2001. So I started um, as a political activist in the student movement in the, in the, in the 1980s. And I remember that we had struggles even then around anti-Semitism. For example, there was a movement, um, an anti-Zionist movement, which tried to prohibit Jewish societies on campus in the 80s, which said that Jewish societies were Zionist and were therefore racist and therefore shouldn't be allowed um, to have a place on campus. And so we were involved in those struggles in the 80s, but they were really marginal struggles. Um, you know, in the kind of really Stalinist and, and far left circles. Um, and the story of my book really is a story of how that came into the mainstream. So now we have a leader of the Labour Party who um, comes from that political tradition. And um, it's become a, a, a kind of big um, issue really in, in mainstream Labour politics. You know, the, the book tells the story of how so in the early 2000s that came via, for me anyway, via the trade union, which is the trade union for academics in universities called the University and College Union. And there was a big campaign for the boycott of Israel and the boycott of Israeli academics to stop um, anyone connected with an Israeli university from coming to Britain or from being allowed on our campuses or in our journals or on our conferences. And of course, this campaign brings with it um, anti-Semitic discourse and anti-Semitic feelings and anti-Semitic ways of thinking. So that was sort of 2003 to 2010 or so. And we thought at the time that the struggle within the union was a prototype of the struggle, which is going to uh, move into the whole of the Labour movement. And we were right um, with the, the victory of the Jeremy Corbyn faction. Um, and, and that's the situation that we're in now. Um, maybe I should tell you that really the kinds of things we're worried about in terms of Jeremy Corbyn and his politics. Yeah, maybe um, because um, also in the German context, the British context, especially of the Labour Party, is yeah. not that familiar to everyone. As far as I'm informed, um, the Labour Party recently experienced some some changes also with the new uh, head of the party in its um, yeah um, in the weight of of the different political wings or streams. Is that That's right. So, yeah. so it's a it's a rather strange and surprising story of the Labour Party. Um, people will know that the the Labour Party was in government um, for a long time in in the early two thousands with Tony Blair and later on with Gordon Brown. And um, of course, the left um, grew more and more, or the far left grew more and more angry with that political tradition. And eventually, um, anyway, it was defeated by the right, by the Conservatives. And um, then we had Conservative governments. And then we had the Labour Party lost another election. And um, in a kind of surprise, really, Jeremy Corbyn, who was a 
not a leading politician at all, but a kind of uh, very marginal backbench figure, somebody who had been around um, the um, Morning Star political uh, tradition, which is a kind of Stalinist communist tradition. Jeremy Corbyn suddenly, really to everybody's surprise, was elected leader of the Labour Party. And also to everybody's surprise, really um, kind of keyed into a mood of um, rebellion. And um, the problem is that uh, one of the ways in which people articulate that rebellion, or one of the ways in which some people attempted to articulate that rebellion, is by a kind of relentless focus on Israel as a as a, a sort of symbol of global imperialism, as a symbol of everything that's wrong in the world. And with that tends to come older sort of narratives and ways of thinking about um, Israel being a sort of absolute evil and and analogies with um, uh the old, you know, the older stories about conspiracy and the killing of Jesus and things like that kind of seep into the ways in which people think. Let me give you an example. Um, and it's a quite, a, it's a, I think it's an interesting example because it's not, uh, let me tell you, um, we had a big introductory meeting for students um, at our college and the, the guy from the student union gets five minutes to speak. And he introduces the student union. He says, we run political campaigns. We run campaigns against fascism. We run campaigns against student fees. And we run campaigns against the occupation. And then he kind of moved on to talk about sports clubs and this and that. And I'm sitting in this big room of staff and colleagues and students, and I'm thinking, how does everybody know which occupation he's talking about? And how does everybody know why this occupation is the kind of symbolic occupation for all oppression across the world. And it became clear at that moment to me that our students at the age of 18 were being brought into the world of, of radical political activity via this kind of key symbolic issue. And so um, that's one of the ways in which I think the Israel-Palestine issue and the kind of hostility that comes with it operates. Um, it's a way of defining our political identity as being kind of radical. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, it seems very obvious that uh, for the topic of uh, anti-Semitism in the left, um, you were uh, involved since you're involved in, in, in political movements. But um, How can you explain to us that um, the topic of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party is nowadays um, that important? Or, um, I don't know, maybe it has uh, something to do with uh, yeah, the governor of, of London or with yeah, recent, uh, um, yeah, recent yeah. events or polemics. Well, look, I, I can tell you lots of stories. Um, which involved the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn. You raised the issue of the mayor of London, um, actually the ex-mayor of London, uh, Ken Livingstone. Um, and Ken Livingstone is a, has always been quite a mainstream, popular, socialist spokesperson. Um, he was uh, kind, he was, he had a position similar to mayor of London when I was a teenager. And then, The whole structure was recreated later and he became the mayor of London. He had two terms and he has been involved for his whole political career in, in a particular kind of anti-Zionist tradition. Um, so to cut a very long story short, later, um, about a year or two ago, in fact, there was an MP called Naz Shah. And um, Naz Shah, everyone likes Naz Shah because Naz Shah defeated George Galloway in Bradford. And uh, Naz Shah's uh, tweets and her Facebook posts were kind of exposed in the newspapers. And there was quite a lot of things in Naz Shah's past which were kind of anti-Semitic. So there was sort of jokes about 
moving everybody from Israel uh, into America and and they, they should be transported and it would cost less money than, you know, supporting Israel and kind of mixed with normal Afghanistan stuff. And um, very unusually, what Nasrallah did when faced with this, this kind of exposure was she stopped and she thought and she said, yeah, you know, I think there is a problem. And I think I have fallen into anti-Semitic ways of thinking. And I think I really want to learn and I want to understand and I want to be part of, of you know, making my community and my party understand this better. So she did a proper apology, not a politician's apology, which says, you know, I'm sorry for any offence caused. But she did a proper apology and then she came to a number of people. One of them was me, actually, and said, how can I, you know, work, how can I educate myself on anti-Semitism? Now, Ken Livingston, at the very same moment that she was making this rather serious apology, Ken Livingston went on the, uh, the rounds of the TV stations and the radio stations, and he said, Nad Shah has done nothing wrong, and then he started talking about Hitler, and he started talking about um, uh, claiming that uh, Hitler was a supporter of Zionism. Hitler was supporting Zionism until he went mad and had this plan to kill the Jews. And, uh, you know, I can explain to you exactly the kind of odd anti-Zionist tradition where Ken Livingston gets his ideas. But when this kind of moves into the mainstream, it was it was really quite shocking. And Livingston doubled down on his um, there was a tribunal in the Labour Party and he started telling all these really eccentric and strange stories. He said it's true that Hitler was a supporter of Zionism, and it's true that the Zionists went to Hitler and asked Hitler to prohibit sermons in synagogues in Yiddish because they wanted Hitler to force Jews to speak Hebrew, and a whole load of really, you know, that they said that Hitler only allowed the swastika and the uh, Zionist flag to be flown in Germany. I mean, Ken Livingston really pushed hard on this idea that the Nazis and, and, and the Zionists were somehow similar. And, you know, most ordinary people in the world think that Zionism was some kind of response to Nazism and was some kind of, you know, effort for Jewish self-defense against this kind of huge threat to their very existence. But Ken Livingston wants to educate young people in Britain to think that um, Zionism and the state of Israel is kind of similar to Hitler and, and um, Nazi Germany. Mm. So um, that was one of the kind of most stark examples. Ken Livingston is still a member of the Labour Party, has not been expelled from the Labour Party, is still defended by very, very many people in the Labour Party. Um, so there you go. That's one story. I mean, I can tell you something about Jeremy Corbyn's own particular history. Um, one of the things Jeremy Corbyn does regularly throughout his career is that he sides with anti-Semites against Jews. So, for example, um, there was a, a guy, a, a Palestinian leader called Rad Salah, who was invited to Britain. I think Jeremy Corbyn actually invited him to Britain to have a meeting in the House of Commons. And the Jewish community, the, the Community Security Trust, went to the courts, actually, and they said, look, this guy, Rad Salah, has made speeches um, invoking the blood libel against Jews in Israel. Um, and, you know, this is not criticism of Israel or, or, you know, hostility to the Zionist project or to the occupation. This is talking about Jews in the Middle Ages murdering non-Jewish children in order to use their, bread, their blood in, in their food. Okay? And... Jeremy Corbyn stood up for Rad Salah. He said, this is far from a dangerous man. He's a Palestinian leader. And uh, he invited him to have tea with him in, in the House of Commons. Um, and there's a whole number of um, examples like this. There was another guy, a Church of England vicar, actually called Stephen Sizer, um, who was uh, sort of pushing very, very hard um, anti-Zionist politics, hostility to Israel, and he started himself to kind of say explicitly anti-Semitic things, like saying that um, the 
that he thought Israel was behind 9-11, for example, and talking about the powerful people in the shadows uh, opposing the boycott of Israel and things like that. And Corbyn wrote a letter to the Church of England, actually defending Sizer, saying that uh, Sizer was a victim of a smear of the Zionist lobby. And this idea of the smear is very, very important because when anti-racist, you know, genuine anti-racists and Jewish groups raise the issue of anti-Semitism, very often the response that is given to them is, you don't really think there's anti-Semitism here. All you're trying to do is to silence criticism of Israel, to silence uh, criticism of Zionism, and to silence and to smear and to damage the left. So this idea of smearing is a kind of um, allegation of conspiracy. If I say I'm worried about Jeremy Corbyn because he worked for Press TV, he worked for the Iranian regime's television service in, in English language, and he was paid by it, and Press TV is an anti-Semitic TV station, then the standard answer will be you're just trying to smear Jeremy Corbyn and you're trying to silence his support for the Palestinians. So it's a kind of gaslighting. I don't know if your audience um, understands the term gaslighting, but it's a kind of attempt to make everybody think that the Jews who raise the issue of anti-Semitism, who worry about the issue of anti-Semitism, are themselves not only wrong, but are kind of, you know, up to something or up to a conspiracy or are kind of going a bit mad and a bit paranoid. And, and the I think I've come to this term gaslighting recently because what it does in the end is it makes Jews worry that, that they're making it up. <laughs> and um, so there's this kind of very strong response which says um, anyone who raises the issue of anti-Semitism is doing so in a kind of disgraceful move to mobilize a sort of Jewish victim power against the oppressed. Um, I'm just looking at a, a, um, a headline of a, a left-wing newspaper, um, which is called The Word. Um, and the front, there's a huge front page, and the big headline says, which side are you on? And on one side... It has four photographs. It has four um, black children. They look like they're somewhere in Africa. They look like they're hungry and poor. It has Jeremy Corbyn. It has Ken Livingston. And it has Jackie Walker. Jackie Walker is an anti-Zionist activist who said that she uh, thought we needed to talk about um, the connection between uh, rich Jews and the Atlantic slave trade. So so it says, which side are you on? And it's four black children, Corbyn, Livingston, Walker. And on the other side, it has a picture of the demonstration, Jews demonstrating against anti-Semitism. It has Theresa May, the conservative Brexit prime minister. It has Tony Blair. And it has actually someone else who I don't know who it is. <laughs> but you understand the point. Yes. That, that the Jewish community and its demonstration against anti-Semitism is being portrayed as being against the, you know, the interest of poor black kids in Africa and against the left and um, on the on the side of Tony Blair and his imperialist wars and, and all of that narrative. But I think that's interesting because, so as far as I recognized in Germany, there are like two wings in Labour Party. There's a left wing and there's a Tony Blair wing and it's the left wing which comes with excessive anti-Zionism and anti-Semitic um, sayings? Or is there yeah. also a left-wing tradition inside Labour Party or left movements which is cr uh, more critical to anti-Semitism? Yes, absolutely. I mean, look, the, one of the things that you often come across is people just don't understand that anti-Semitism is possible on the left. And, and there's a real failure of educating people within our own movement, right? We, you know, people who know, they understand that, you know, Marx was involved in these debates with anti-Semites, with Bruno Bauer, with During, with uh, Bakunin, 
and you had August Babel talking about the socialism of fools, and you have, you know, the, the history of, of the Stalinist anti-Semitism and what happened in East Germany and, and uh, Poland in 1968, and, you know, the Red Army faction and George Galloway and Respect and Farrakhan. You know, we all understand that there is a genuine left-wing tradition of anti-Semitism. And, and one can kind of understand where it comes from. It comes from the left, which looks at the world and says the world is terrible. It's run, you know, in favor of the rich and powerful. And it looks for a simple kind of conspiracy of power to understand why the world is so terrible. And it's, con and it's always attracted. There is, you know, an element on the left which is attracted to anti-Semitism. Uh, yet, as I said, there have always been people on the left uh, who have opposed and critiqued that anti-Semitism. August Babel being a famous one. I would argue Marx, too, was a critic of left anti-Semitism, although that's controversial. Um, and, you know, the left has had its totalitarian wing and its democratic anti-totalitarian wing, and you can trace it throughout the history of the left. Um, and so, yes, in the Labour Party also there's a kind of... Um, I mean, look, I suspect that denouncing people as Blairites has become also a kind of symbolic denunciation, um, which doesn't really have all that much meaning to it. Um, you know, anyone who opposes uh, anti-Semitism is denounced as a Blairite, as a Tory, as a Zionist. Um, you know, look, race is constructed by racists, right? You know, a black person might have a very empowering and liberational identity of themselves as a black person, as beautiful and strong and good and all of that. But if you're walking down a street and somebody de defines you as black from outside and threatens you as black, it's a different business. And the way Jews get defined as Zionists and the meaning of Zionists in that definition being... Nazi, racist, pro-apartheid, Blairite, conservative. So Jews get, you know, they, I mean, I feel that this happened to me intellectually, actually, to quite a large extent. There was a time when I was a, you know, a quite an up-and-coming young sociologist, and I started writing a little bit about anti-Semitism and campaigning against anti-Zionism, and then I was defined as a Zionist. And you know, if you ask me, I don't really mind being defined as a Zionist in my own terms, but that's not what happens here. What happens when I get defined as a Zionist by sociology is that I get defined as a racist and as pro-apartheid and a defender of Nazis. So you understand that there's a kind of symbolic life in the way that hostility to Israel um, kind of illuminates and symbolizes much more than itself in, in terms of um, how people position themselves and how people think of themselves and who they are and who their enemies are. Yeah, would you say that um, these um, associations from outside to the term Zionists um, is uh, one of the specifics of left-wing anti-Semitism? Well, it, it, it's interesting because it, there is, I mean, look, the creation, the construction of Zionism as pro-imperialist and as apartheid, you can actually trace it back really clearly to the Soviet Union and actually to the KGB and to, you know, to a, an attempt by the Soviet state to build a movement um, not only against Israel, but against Jews. Of course, in Germany, in East Germany, and in Poland in 1968, the anti-Semitic campaign against the intellectuals was conducted via a, a, a hate campaign against Zionism. And that's quite interesting, because we tend to say, I tend to say that today, the people who carry anti-Semitic ways of thinking are not really aware of it. They're not people who are fundamentally anti-Semitic, who are using anti-Zionism as a kind of dirty trick. 
But in Poland and in Germany in 1968, they were. In, in that case, the rhetoric was the same, but you can clearly see that the anti-Semitic communist states were trying to uh, purge the Jews, and they were using this um, uh, anti-Zionist rhetoric in order to do so. So, and, and But this is not a part of our history, the history of the left that people are really aware of. Um, hang on, I've slightly lost the question. What was the question? Um, that the um, term Zionism interpreted in the way you um, just uh, try to to explain. Yeah. That this is part because you before you spoke about um, a genuine uh, left anti-Semitism, and I asked myself yep. if you consider uh, the. Um, the taking this meaning to Zionism, uh, a special um, characteristic of of left wing antisemitism. Mm. Yeah, and, I in think... order to in order to maybe to contrast it also to um, right wing uh, antisemitism. Uh, yes, I remember. Uh, sorry, I remember the question, and the question was: Is this a kind of? Is, I, what I heard partly was: Is this only on the left? And what I wanted to say was that there is a a kind of hostility, a hatred of Zionists on the right, and there is a, a hatred of Zionists amongst political milieus where you don't know whether people are left or right, and then there is a kind of genuinely left anti-Zionism. So let me give you another story. My book, by the way, is full of stories which kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. There was a mural painted on a wall in London by a, a person who considers himself an artist. And the mural showed these kind of stereotypical Jewish figures, uh, Jewish and Freemasonry figures, um, sort of making money, may, getting rich on the backs of the poor. Okay? And people said about this mural on the wall in East London, people said, look, it's anti-Semitic. And actually the council, I think, who were responsible for it took it down And Jeremy Corbyn, uh, this is some years ago, Jeremy Corbyn jumped to the defense, to the defense of the artist, and compared it to the whitewashing of Diego Rivera's um, murals by the Ford Foundation in, in the United States in the 30s. Um, and um, later on this week, actually, Corbyn sort of re-looked at the image and he said, oh, no, no, I can see now that it was anti-Semitic, I'm terribly sorry. Um, but there's, it's not clear whether this is a sort of Nazi right-wing conspiracy theory or, or a left-wing conspiracy theory. And in fact, the artist this week, when he wanted to speak, he wrote a blog page on the blog of a, a, a character called David Icke. David Icke is a very strange man. When I was a kid, David Icke used to do the sports broadcasting on the television, Before that, he was the goalkeeper for Coventry City. And then he suddenly became a kind of wild conspiracy theorist. And he talked about um, the world being run by invisible lizards and, and you know, the kind yeah. of craziest conspiracy thinking. And he, David Icke, talks a lot about what he calls Rothschild Zionism. So taking oh, yeah. the kind of anti-Semitic trope of the Rothschild and the bankers and merging it with Zionism. When this artist wanted to, to hurt, he went to David Icke. Hmm. And um, so, you know, th there's a sort of, there's all kinds of crossover. You know, live in a world, especially in the last few years, with the Brexit movement and the Trump movement, when populist politics is is kind of appearing not only on the left, but also on the right. And often it has quite a lot in common. For example, the focus on the on mainstream media, you know, the, the fake news, the media lies. So this week, there's been quite a lot in the media in Britain about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. And the, the sort of stock answer from the left of the Labour Party is, this is fake news, the media lies, um, it's, it's a, a story that's got up by the Zionist lobby, and has been embraced by, you know, the people who are responsible for fake news. So 
very similar to what Donald Trump might say, yeah? And there's a, 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 a whole number of other similarities, actually, between this kind of left populism and um, the, the new right populism. Let me give you another example. If you were to raise the issue of racism or xenophobia, you would say, for example, I would, I'm worried about the Brexit movement, that the Brexit movement mobilizes a, a sort of hatred. It, it says that the key problems that Britain faces are about foreigners. Foreigners from, from Romania and Poland and Muslims coming, taking our jobs, and foreigners in Brussels and Germany and France telling us what to do and ruling our country. And if I was to raise, you know, a worry about xenophobia and racism connected to the Brexit movement, there would be a kind of huge um, angry denial and counter-accusation. So it's difficult to have proper discussions about anti-Semitism, just as it's difficult to have a proper discussion about xenophobia in the Brexit movement, because there's just denial and counter-accusation of conspiracy. You're only saying that in order to um, to silence the voice of the oppressed, the, the voice of the white working class in the case of Brexit, or the voice of the Palestinians in the case of left anti-Semitism. Um, and the, the kind of forms, the rhetorical forms of the right populist and the left populist have a lot in common, in my view. If you remember the final day campaign video of the Donald Trump campaign, um, it was called, what was it called? Uh, something for America. Um, it was a story, a video story of, of how the globalists, the, and it didn't mention Jews, but it showed a lot of Jews and money, the money people, the cosmopolitans, the metropolitans had been responsible for closing down the factories and selling the jobs off to China. These narratives are close to anti-Semitism. They're related to anti-Semitism and they pop up on both the mainstream right and the mainstream left now. Um. When I read your Facebook page, I saw something about an um, organization of Jewish labor members fighting anti-Semitism. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, I mean, look, the, 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 so there's two things that I'll, that I'll mention when I answer that question. One is that, in fact, many, you know, My father used to tell me this story. My father came from the East End of London, the Jewish community, and he used to say, he, you know, no Jews voted anything but Labour. All Jews voted Labour, he said. Um, and, I mean, true, that changed a little bit when Jews started moving to uh, different areas and, and in the 1980s when there was some Jewish support for Margaret Thatcher and things like that. But today... There is a kind of huge um, Jewish uh, retreat from the Labour Party. Um, there was a poll that said only 13 percent of Jews are, are willing to, were willing to vote Labour in the last election. Um, and as I said, the context of that is one generation ago, all Jews used to vote Labour pretty well. Um, so, and there's a kind of controversy within the Jewish community. Some people say. Some people are really angry with any Jewish person who votes Labour saying that they're supporting an anti-Semitic party and anti-Semitic politics. And then lots of Jewish people who are still in the Labour Party and who are fighting against anti-Semitism in the Labour Party say, um, you know, that's not true. What we're trying to do is to save our party. And, and there's a, I mean, it's quite a, a sad um, uh, conflict, really, because if you leave the Labour Party in protest and you say, I've had enough of this, and I want to denounce the party, then, of course, the people who haven't left are kind of undermining your message. On the other hand, if you stay in the Labour Party and you fight and you put motions and you educate people about anti-Semitism, then the people who leave are kind of undermining your struggle. So there's a tendency for, you know, each set of, of Jews really to blame the other. And it seems to me that that's really misplaced, given that... The problem is with anti-Semitism and not with Jews doing the wrong thing about anti-Semitism. The other thing that's very important is um, 
the uh, the anti-Zionist Jews. So the overwhelming majority of the Jewish community have some kind of positive relationship with Israel. They identify, you know, in some sense, sometimes critically, sometimes not critically, but they think of Israel as being part of the kind of global Jewish story, really. So most Jews are in some sense, at least in the sense of the anti-Zionists, most Jews are Zionists. But um, many anti-Zionists are Jewish. <laughs> so most Jews are, are not anti-Zionist, but many anti-Zionists are Jewish. Do you see what I mean? So there are small groups of uh, Jewish anti-Zionists who they indulge in a kind of strange version of identity politics. They take out and they parade their Jewish identity. Um, they speak, they, the, the phrase, as a Jew, they, they kind of stand up and say, as a Jew, I'm here to tell you that there's no anti-Semitism at all and that all the anti-Semitism is invented by the Zionists. And they do a lot of damage. And some people say that, that these Jews are kind of the useful idiots of the, of the anti-Semitic movement. I don't think that's true even. I think that a lot of the impetus for the current anti-Zionism and hostility to Israel and the boycott movement and the defense of anti-Semitic politics, a lot of it comes from these small um, Jewish groups who mobilize their Jewish identities in order to try to talk to non-Jews and to try to reassure them that there's nothing anti-Semitic about conspiracy theory or about this mural or about working for press TV. And those who raise the issue of anti-Semitism are just kind of, you know, working for Israel. So um, many Jews are fighting back. Many Jews are fighting back within the Labour Party and outside of the Labour Party. But there's a very small and very noisy kind of as a Jew movement, which wants to position itself as the Jewish community. It's a kind of, it's, it reminds me a bit of replacement theology. They want to kind of replace, you know, the voice of, of the institutions of the Jewish community with themselves. And they want to be treated in the rainbow of identity politics as the Jewish community. Um, Have so, you an explanation you know, for their motivation uh, well, to defend their I, position? Yeah, I mean, I think on one level, it's not complicated. On one level, you know, I can well understand that many Jews are particularly interested in Israel. You know, they have uh, all sorts of family and, and, and other reasons to be particularly interested in Israel. And I can understand that many Jews are particularly, you know, worried and bothered by the things that Israel does wrong. And, you know, I myself, I'm Jewish and I myself probably am more bothered by what Israel does wrong than by what Congo does wrong or what, you know, Robert Mugabe does wrong. Okay, so that's understandable. What sometimes happens then is it becomes a kind of obsessional politics. It's a kind of... Jewish obsession about the evils of Israel and, and positioning Israel as the kind of center of the world, as the Nazis, as um, the block to peace in the Middle East. The thing that stands between us and the good life is Israel. So from a kind of Jewish interest in Israel, it becomes a kind of Jewish obsession with Israel. And then what happens is that these Jewish obsessionals bring their obsession out into wider civil society and they try to encourage wider civil society to adopt their own Jewish obsession. But of course, when it's the Labour Party or when it's a trade union, it takes on a different meaning. Um, you know, I don't mind if a little group of, of sort of rather obsessional Jews go around sort of denouncing Israel, but when they encourage and, and try to make my trade union center its own political life around the evils of Israel, then we have a different uh, phenomenon going on. And the other thing I would say about that is that there's a kind of, I mean, in a sense, I think, if we go back to the, the concept of gaslighting, I think there's quite a lot of pressure really on us not to make too much of a fuss. It's a kind of very British 
ethic, isn't it? Let's not make too much of a fuss. Let's not to make too much noise. Let's not talk about ourselves too much. And I think people are worried about the possibility of anti-Semitism, but they would much rather live in a world where they didn't have to worry about that. And they would much rather live in a world where it was the foolishness of Jews which caused the trouble than something that Jews are not in control of. So there's a kind of temptation to a worldview which says if only the other Jews didn't behave so badly, then we wouldn't have anti-Semitism coming down upon our heads. It's quite a kind of common response to racism. I mean, I think in Germany before the Holocaust, there was a kind of, there was a kind of friction between the um, German Jews and, and, and all these Jews coming from the East who were kind of less educated. And some of the German Jews were worried that, that these Eastern Jews would kind of make them look bad in Germany. Um, and I think, you know, one can see it in all, all sorts of cases where um, victims of racism sort of turn on their own community and they say, if only these other people wouldn't behave so badly, then we wouldn't be targeted by racism. So it's a kind of fundamentally, um, it's a fundamentally problematic way of thinking about anti-Semitism and, and racism. But um, I think it's also symptomatic of a kind of, of, of a kind of unspoken fear about anti-Semitism. You know, it, it's difficult to know how to think. Because in lots of senses in Britain and in America too, perhaps even more so, you know, Jews have a good life. They 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 are part of all sorts of you know the life of the country, and they have access to all sorts of education and professions and things like that. So in a sense, things are very good for Jews. But um, there's this kind of background of things that one may or may not worry about, and I think the anti-Zionist Jews don't want to worry about it. They want to be recognized as big intellectuals and big professors and not Zionist intellectuals and Zionist professors. And they want to be recognized as Labour Party people and not Zionist Labour Party people. And they kind of turn on a, on a safer target, really, which is the Jewish community as a whole. And they say, if only the Jewish community behaved better, then we wouldn't be hated. Um, so I, I think that's something about the... Um, the kind of motivation does that make sense yeah yeah it sounds it sounds uh yeah pretty logic <laughs> and yeah uh good insight but yeah what i'm interested in um you talked before about um equalities between left-wing and right-wing populists and yeah if we have a look to germany we can see left-wing anti-semitism also but if we yep. look if we look to the right to party like alternative for germany yeah we see a very strange mode which is like okay we are pro israel we are against immigration of muslims because we yeah. we as right wingers oppose anti-semitism and on the other yeah. hand we have a movement on the right which is like okay let's forget about the holocaust um let's not make monuments yeah. about it um how yeah. how is it in britain with ukip Well, in fact, there have been tweets going around um, this week from the Brexit campaign from people who want, you know, Britain to leave the European Union um, saying, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but there's, you know, left anti-Semitism has been big in the news. And they're saying, well, what do you expect when you bring in all these Muslims and when the Labour Party is trying to um, uh, compete for Muslim votes? So that the right-wing xenophobes are kind of trying to latch on to the campaign against anti-Semitism and make it their own. And we see a lot of this. And, the, you know, people from the AFD in Germany and people like Gert Wilders and, and the kind of populist right, Marine Le Pen, um, have all tried to kind of present themselves as pro-Israeli. And that presentation is kind of fundamentally dishonest. Um, and partly it sort of depends on a on an, an anti-Semitic notion of what Israel is, really. They think that, you know, the picture painted by the anti-Zionists of Israel is true. The only difference is they like it and the others don't like it. So 
when people say, you know, Israel is this white enclave which knows how to kill Muslims and to 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 be oppressive and. Um, you know, some of the right in Europe like it and some of the left in Europe don't like it, but it's the same mistaken image. Yeah. And still, uh, I think there's also um, this um, explanation by um, um, ethno pluralist ideology that you can like a country. For example, as the AfD says, they don't have nothing against foreigners as long as they stay in their country. So Arabs yeah. should stay in Arab countries and Israel is no problem as long as the Jews stay in Israel. Yes. Well, there's an irony, isn't there? Because, of course, um, before the state of Israel existed, um, uh, Jews were told, you know, you're not really British, you're not really French, you're not really German, go home. And now that the state of Israel exists, people, Jews are told... Well, you shouldn't be in Israel either. <laughs> you know, the the Jews are kind of not at home in their own countries, and they're not at home in Israel. There's no home for them at all. I mean, that's one of the rather kind of frightening um, feelings of homelessness that you can get um, when you look at anti-Semitic material. And it's mirrored, I think, by a feeling of political homelessness that many of us want to be at home in the Labour Party. You know, we want a strong National Health Service. We want a strong liberal Europe, European Union. We want, um, you know, workers' rights kind of uniting across Europe. We, we want to be in the Labour Party, but we are made homeless because when we're in the Labour Party, we are told that we don't belong. We're told that we're Tories. We're told that we're racist. We're told that we're Zionists. And we're told that we don't really belong there. Um, so uh, the idea of kind of feeling politically homeless, I think, relates to a kind of rather old Jewish experience of homelessness, um, you know, first in, in, in the realm of ideas and then actually in the realm of, of um, reality. Okay. Okay. Um, so... Is there anything you want to say? Because I, I don't think we have any questions anymore. At least not. In, at least not instantly. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I could talk and talk. I think, but um, no. I mean, of course, I would love it if people read my book. My book is called Contemporary Left Antisemitism, and it's available on Amazon. In fact, I think I'm going to be speaking in uh, Frankfurt and in Heidelberg uh, next month. Uh, so do look at the book. People can Google me and find me on Facebook and uh, Twitter and look at my Goldsmiths homepage. There's links to lots of things that I've written. Uh, my name is David Hirsch, um, H-I-R-S-H. -H. Um, sorry for not being able to speak to you in German. <laughs> There's one other thing, actually, that I might say, which is that I know a lot of the people, especially on the Marxist left in, in Germany, And the very best democratic Marxist left in Germany owe a lot to Moish Postone. And uh, Moish, people may know, died um, very recently. So I would just um, kind of remind people really to go and find Moish's work. Um, and, and Moish is really, really clear and interesting um, on this, um, this whole uh, discussion. 